Welcome to the Puritan and Reformed Audiobook Podcast. It occurred to me, as I was looking over the revival works of Jonathan Edwards, there's one all of these years that I've missed. I had already narrated a narrative of many surprising conversions, thoughts on the present revival of religion, the distinguishing marks of a work of the Spirit of God, and even a treatise on the religious affections, and somehow I missed an account of the revival of religion in Northampton, 1740 to 1742. So I will commence that work today. It's communicated in a letter to the Reverend Thomas Prince of Boston, Northampton, December 12, 1743. Reverend and dear Sir, Ever since the great work of God that was wrought here about nine years ago, there has been a great and abiding alteration in this town in many respects. There has been vastly more religion kept up in the town among all sorts of persons in religious exercises, and in common conversation there has been a great alteration among the youth of the town. With respect to revelry, frolicking, profane, and licentious conversation, and lewd songs, and there has also been a great alteration amongst both old and young with regard to tavern haunting. I suppose the town has been in no measure so free of vice in these respects for any long time together for sixty years as it has been these nine years past. There has also been an evident alteration with respect to a charitable spirit to the poor, though I think with regard to this we in this town as well as the land in general come far short of gospel rules. And though after that great work nine years ago, there has been a very lamentable decay of religious affections and the engagedness of people's spirit in religion, yet many societies for prayer and social worship were all along kept up, and there were some few instances of awakening and deep concern about the things of another world even in the most dead time. In the year 1740, in the spring before Mr. Whitfield came to this town, there was a visible alteration. There was more seriousness in religious conversation, especially among young people. Those things that were of ill tendency among them were foreborn, and it was a very frequent thing for persons to consult their minister upon the salvation of their souls. And in some particular persons there appeared a great attention about that time. And thus it continued until Mr. Whitfield came to town, which was about the middle of October following. He preached here four sermons in the meeting house, besides a private lecture at my house, one on Friday, another on Saturday, and two upon the Sabbath. The congregation was extraordinarily melted by every sermon, almost the whole assembly being in tears for a great part of sermon time. Mr. Whitfield's sermons were suitable to the circumstances of the town, containing a just reproof of our backslidings, and in a most moving and affecting manner, making we of our great professions and great mercies as arguments with us to return to God from whom we had departed. Immediately after this, the minds of the people in general appeared more engaged in religion, showing a greater forwardness to make religion the subject of their conversation, and to meet frequently for religious purposes, and to embrace all opportunities to hear the word preached. The revival at first appeared chiefly among professors, and those that had entertained hope that they were in a state of salvation, to whom Mr. Whitfield chiefly addressed himself. But in a very short time there appeared an awakening and deep concern among some young persons that looked upon themselves in a Christless state and there were some hopeful appearances of conversion, and some professors were greatly revived. In about a month or six weeks, there was a great attention in the town, both as to the revival of professors and the awakening of others. By the middle of December, a considerable work of God appeared among those that were very young, and the revival of religion continued to increase, so that in the spring an engagingness of spirit about the things of religion was become very general amongst young people and children, and religious subjects almost wholly took up their conversation when they were together. In the month of May 1741, a sermon was preached to a company at a private house. Near the conclusion of the discourse, one or two persons that were professors were so greatly affected with the sense of the greatness and glory of divine things and the infinite importance of the things of eternity, that they were not able to conceal it, the affection of their minds overcoming their strength, 
and having a very visible effect upon their bodies. When the exercises were over, the young people that were present were moved into the other room for religious conference, and particularly that they might have opportunity to inquire of those that were thus affected, what apprehensions they had, and what things they were that thus deeply impressed their minds, and there soon appeared a very great effect of their conversation. The affection was quickly propagated throughout the room. Many of the young people and children that were professors appeared to be overcome with a sense of the greatness and glory of divine things, and with admiration, love, joy, and praise, and compassion to others that looked upon themselves as in a state of nature. And many others at the same time were overcome with distress about their sinful and miserable estate and condition, so that the whole room was full of nothing but outcries, faintings, and the like. Others soon heard of it in several parts of the town and came to them, and what they saw and heard there was greatly affecting to them, so that many of them were overpowered in like manner. And it continued thus for some hours, the time being spent in prayer, singing, counseling, and conferring. There seemed to be a consequent happy effect of that meeting to several particular persons, and on the state of religion in the town in general. After this were meetings from time to time attended with like appearances. But a little after it, at the conclusion of the public exercises on the Sabbath, I appointed the children that were under seventeen years of age to go from the meeting house to a neighboring house, that I might there further enforce what they had heard in public, and might give in some counsels proper for their age. The children were there very generally, and greatly affected with the warnings and counsels that were given them, and many exceedingly overcome and the room was filled with cries, and when they were dismissed, they almost all of them went home crying aloud through the streets to all parts of the town. The like appearances attended several such meetings of children that were appointed, but their affections appeared by what followed to be of a very different nature. In many they appeared indeed but childish affections, and in a day or two would leave them as they were before, Others were deeply impressed. Their convictions took fast hold of them and abode by them. And there were some that, from one meeting to another, seemed extraordinarily affected for some time to but little purpose, their affections presently vanishing from time to time, but yet afterwards were seized with abiding convictions and their affections became durable. About the middle of the summer I called together the young people that were communicants from sixteen to twenty-six years of age to my house, which proved to be a most happy meeting. Many seemed to be very greatly and most agreeably affected with those views which excited humility, self-condemnation, self-abhorrence, love, and joy. Many fainted under these affections. We had several meetings that summer of young people attended with like appearances. It was about that time that there first began to be crimes out in the meeting house, which several times occasioned many of the congregation to stay in the house after the public exercises were over, to confer with those who seemed to be overcome with religious convictions and affections, which was found to tend much to the propagation of their impressions, with lasting effect upon many, conference being at these times commonly joined with prayer and singing. In the summer and autumn, the children in various parts of the town had religious meetings by themselves for prayer, sometimes joined with fasting, wherein many of them seemed to be greatly and properly affected, and I hope some of them savingly wrought upon. The month of August and September were the most remarkable of any this year for appearances of the conviction and conversion of sinners, and great revivings, quickenings, and comforts of professors, and for extraordinary external effects of these things. It was a very frequent thing to see a house full of outcries, faintings, convulsions, and such like, both with distress and also with admiration and joy. It was not the manner here to hold meetings all night, as in some places, nor was it common to continue them till very late in the night. But it was pretty often so, that there were some that were so affected and their bodies so overcome that they could not go home, but were obliged to stay all night where they were. 
There was no difference that I know of here with regard to these extraordinary effects and meetings in the night and in the daytime, the meetings in which these effects appeared in the evening being commonly begun, and their extraordinary effects in the day, and continued in the evening, and some meetings have been very remarkable for such extraordinary effects that were both begun and finished in the daytime. There was an appearance of a glorious progress of the work of God upon the hearts of sinners in conviction and conversion this summer and autumn in great numbers. I think we have reason to hope or brought savingly home to Christ. But this was remarkable. The work of God and his influence of this nature seemed to be almost wholly upon a new generation. Those that were not come to years of discretion in that wonderful season nine years ago. Children, or those that were then children, Others who had enjoyed that former glorious opportunity without any appearance of saving benefit seem now to be almost wholly passed over and let alone. But now we had the most wonderful work among children that ever was in Northampton. The former outpouring of the Spirit was remarkable for influences upon the minds of children, beyond all that had ever been before. But this far exceeded that, indeed, as to influences on the minds of professors, this work was by no means confined to a new generation. Many of all ages partook of it, but yet in this respect it was more general on those that were of the young sort. Many who had been formally wrought upon and in the time of our declension had fallen into decays and had in a great measure left God and gone after the world, now passed under a very remarkable new work of the Spirit of God as if they had been the subjects of a second conversion. They were first led into the wilderness and had a work of conviction, having much deeper convictions of the sins of both nature and practice than ever before, though with some new circumstances, and something new in the kind of conviction, and some with great distress beyond what they had felt before their first conversion. Under these convictions they were excited to strive for salvation, and the kingdom of heaven suffered violence from some of them in a far more remarkable manner than before. And after great convictions and humblings and agonizing with God, they had Christ discovered to them anew as an all-sufficient Savior, and in the glories of His grace, and in a far more clear manner than before, and with greater humility, self-emptiness, and brokenness of heart, and a purer, a higher joy, and greater desires after holiness of life, but with greater self-diffidence and distrust of their treacherous hearts. One circumstance in which this work differed from that which had been in the towns five or six years before was that conversions were frequently wrought more sensibly and visibly, the impressions stronger and more manifest by their external effects, the progress of the Spirit of God in conviction from step to step more apparent, and the transition from one state to another more sensible and plain, so that it might, in many instances, be as it were seen by bystanders, the preceding season had been very remarkable on this account, beyond what had been before, but this more remarkable than that. And in this season, these apparent or visible conversions, if I may so call them, were more frequently in the presence of others at religious meetings, where the appearances of what was wrought on the heart fell under public observation. After September 1741, there seemed to be some abatement of these extraordinary appearances, yet they did not wholly cease, but there was something of them from time to time all winter. About the beginning of February 1742, Mr. Buell came to this town. I was then absent from home and continued so till about a fortnight after. Mr. Buell preached from day to day, almost every day, in the meeting house. I left to him the free use of my pulpit having heard of his design visit before I went from home. He spent almost a whole time in religious exercises with the people, either in public or private, the people continually thronging him. When he first came, there came with him a number of the zealous people from Suffield, who continued here for some time. There were very extraordinary effects in Mr. Buell's labors, the people were exceedingly moved, crying out in great numbers in the meeting house, and a great part of the congregation commonly staying in the house of God for hours after the public service. 
Many also were exceedingly moved in private meetings, where Mr. Buell was. Almost a whole town seemed to be in a great and continual commotion, day and night. And there was indeed a very great revival of religion. But it was principally among professors. The appearances of a work of conversion were in no measure as great as they had been the summer before. When I came home, I found the town in very extraordinary circumstances, such as, in some respects, I never saw it in before. Mr. Buell continued here a fortnight or three weeks after I returned, there being still great appearances attending his labors, many in their religious affections being raised far beyond what they had ever been before, and there were some instances of persons lying in a sort of trance, remaining perhaps for a whole twenty-four hours motionless, and with their senses locked up. But in the meantime, under strong imaginations, as though they went to heaven, and had there a vision of glorious and delightful objects. But when the people were raised to this height, Satan took the advantage, and his interposition, in many instances, soon became very apparent, and a great deal of caution and pains were found necessary to keep the people, many of them, from running wild. In the month of March, I led the people into a solemn public renewal of their covenant with God. To that end, having made a draft of a covenant, I first proposed it to some of the principal men in the church, then to the people in their several religious associations in various parts of the town, then to the whole congregation in public, and then I deposited a copy of it in the hands of each of the four deacons, that all who desired it might resort to them and have opportunity to view and consider it. Then the people in general that were above fourteen years of age first subscribed the covenant with their hands, and then on a day of fasting and prayer altogether presented themselves before the Lord in his house and stood up and solemnly manifested their consent to it. In the beginning of the summer of 1742 there seemed to be an abatement of the liveliness of people's affections in religion, but yet many were often in a great height of them and in the fall and winter following there were at times extraordinary appearances. But in a general people's engagedness in religion and the liveliness of their affections have been on the decline, and some of the young people especially have shamefully lost their liveliness and vigor in religion, and much of the seriousness and solemnity of their spirits. But there are many that walk as become a saints, and to this day there are a considerable number in town that seem to be near to God, and maintain much of the life of religion, and enjoy many of the sensible tokens and fruits of his gracious presence. With respect to the late season of revival of religion amongst us for three or four years past, it has been observable that in the former part of it, in the years 1740 and 41, the work seemed to be much more pure, having less of a corrupt mixture than in the former great outpouring of the Spirit, in 1735 and 1736. Persons seemed to be sensible of their former errors and had learned more of their own hearts, and experience had taught them more of the tendency and consequences of things. They were now better guarded, and their affections were not only stronger, but attended with greater solemnity and greater humility and self-distrust, and greater engagedness after holy living and perseverance and there were fewer errors in conduct. But in the latter part of it, in the year 1742, it was otherwise. The work continued more pure till we were infected from abroad, our people hearing of and some of them seeing the work in other places, where there was a greater visible commotion than here, and the outward appearances were more extraordinary. We're ready to think that the work in those places far excelled what was amongst us, and their eyes were dazzled with a high profession and great show that some made who came hither from other places. That those people went so far beyond them in raptures and violent emotions of the affections and a vehement zeal, and what they call boldness for Christ, our people were ready to think was owing to far greater attainments and grace and intimacy with heaven. They looked little in their own eyes in comparison with them, and were ready to submit themselves to them and yield themselves up to their conduct, taking it for granted that everything was right that they said and did. These things had a strange influence on the people and gave many of them a deep and unhappy tincture from which it was a hard and long labor to deliver them. 
and from which some of them are not fully delivered to this day. The effects and consequences of things among us plainly show the following things, namely, that the degree of grace is by no means to be judged of by the degree of joy or the degree of zeal, and that indeed we cannot at all determine by these things who are gracious and who are not, and that it is not the degree of religious affections but the nature of them that is chiefly to be looked at. Some that have had very great raptures of joy and have been extraordinarily filled, as the vulgar phrase is, and have had their bodies overcome, and that very often have manifested far less of the temper of Christians in their conducts. Since then, some others that have been still and have made no great outward show. But then again, there are many others that have had extraordinary joys and emotions of mind with frequent great effects upon their bodies that behave themselves steadfastly as humble, amiable, eminent Christians. It is evident that there may be great religious affections in individuals which may and show an appearance resemble gracious affections and have the same effects on their bodies but are far from having the same effect on the temper of their minds and the course of their lives. And likewise there is nothing more manifest by what appears amongst us than that the good estate of individuals is not chiefly to be judged of by any exactness of steps and method of experiences in what is supposed to be the first conversion, but that we must judge by the spirit that breathes the effect wrought upon the temper of the soul in the time of the work and remaining afterwards. Though there have been very few instances among professors, amongst us, of what is ordinarily called scandalous sins, known to me, yet the temper that some of them show, and the behavior they have been of, together with some things in the nature and circumstances of their experiences, make me much afraid lest there be a considerable number that have woefully deceived themselves. Though, on the other hand, there is a great number whose temper and conversation is such as justly confirms the charity of others towards them, and not a few in whose disposition and walk there are amiable appearances of imminent grace." And notwithstanding all the corrupt mixtures that have been in the late work here, there are not only many blessed fruits of it, in particular persons that yet remain, but some good effects of it upon the town in general. A spirit of party is more extensively subsided. I suppose there has been less appearance these three or four years past of that division of the town into two parties which has long been our bane, than has been at any time during the preceding thirty years, and the people have apparently had much more caution and a greater guard on their spirit and their tongues to avoid contention and unchristian hearts in town meetings and on other occasions. And it is a thing greatly to be re rejoiced in that the people very lately came to an agreement and final issue with respect to their grand controversy relating to their common lands, which has been, above any other particular thing, a source of mutual prejudices, jealousies, and debates for fifteen or sixteen years past. The people also seem to be much more sensible of the danger of resting in old experiences, or what they were subjects of at their supposed first conversion, and to be more fully convinced of the necessity of forgetting the things that are behind, and pressing forward and maintaining earnest labor, watchfulness, and prayerfulness as long as they live. I am, Reverend Sir, your friend and brother, Jonathan Edwards.